Now on BBC Radio 4, the afternoon play. Thanks to the short story writer Saki, we're transported back to a gentler, calmer time. It's a sunny summer's day in the garden of an Edwardian country house. Laura. Dramatised by Sue Eckstein from a short story by Saki. be a lovelier, more innocent sight than the one we see before us on this fine summer's day. The pale morning sun shining down on two of the Shire's most delightful ladies and a litter of enchanting puppies in a verdant garden positively brimming with fruit and flowers. At first glance, it seems there cannot. Shouldn't we take the puppies back to the stable now, Laura? Egbert will be wondering where they've got to. You know how he likes everything in its proper place. Nonsense. You'll never even realise they've been out to play. And aren't you the dearest little creatures? Come here. You've such soft ears and such a darling little wet nose and such lovely sharp white teeth. There. Off you go to your brothers and sisters. I do so wish you'd take them back. Well, there's no need to upset yourself, Amanda. By the time Egbert returns from his attempt to track down the heavily armed gang of poachers in the Highwood, the darling pups will be safely tucked up with their mother. Poachers? You never mentioned poachers and heavily armed? Oh, poor Egbert. Poor Egbert? Poor poachers, more likely. Excuse me, my men. Do you realise that this is my land upon which you are trespassing? <laughs> you may well think that there is pheasant, grouse and quail plenty for us all to partake in the pleasure of the hunt. <laughs> but you would be very much mistaken. Oh, yes, you would be very much mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> By the time his sermon is over, they'll wish they had never come within a hundred miles of that husband of yours. They'll be turning their shotguns on themselves. Anything to silence that infuriating drone. But what if Egbert is in mortal danger? Well, the only danger for your husband will be from his fit of apoplexy, quite possibly lethal, when he realises there never were any poachers in the Highwood. But you just said that there were. And armed to the teeth. Oh, my dearest Amanda, you are the very simplest of souls. Do you really think so? Oh, sweet. And so very, very simple. Oh, oh, look. Look at that dear little puppy chasing its tail. <laughs> Laura, you know the doctor said you should stay indoors and, and preferably in bed. That is merely what doctors are obliged to say. It would be imprudent of them to go round complimenting people on their rude good health. Oh, nonsense, Laura. He was serious. And here you are, out in the garden, sitting on the damp grass, wearing neither hat nor coat. Oh. <coughs> Where are you going? Are you going back inside? Don't you think the puppies would simply adore a little frolic in Egbert's walled garden? Oh, there'll be so much for them to explore in here. No, not in there! In you go, little creatures. No, no, no! Stop! More duck, Egbert, my dear. No, thank you. There's plenty of it. <laughs> I've had quite enough, thank you. Some of the peonies were quite unharmed. There'll be enough for a small bunch in the blue room when your uncle comes to visit next week. Sir Lulworth is so very fond of fresh flowers. It was sheer good fortune that Jeffreys was on hand and managed to catch the dogs before the entire garden was laid waste. As it is, it'll take months to restore it. And I managed to save some of the tall purple and white irises. 
Look, these are only a little bruised. And this one is quite splendid, don't you think? If you turn it round this way. If you say so. How long will we have the pleasure of Laura's company on this occasion, Amanda? Oh, um, Laura's just staying... For what, I dare say, must seem like a lifetime to you, Egbert. Yes, um, Cook was intending to make egg custard for dessert. Well, that's some consolation, I suppose. Yeah, but I'm afraid the sitting hens refused to go back to their nests and all the other eggs were broken in the... In the excitement. The puppies had such fun. Oh, Egbert, you should have seen their tiny tails wagging. What's a few broken eggs in the scheme of things? The hens will doubtless lay again when they've calmed down a little. It's not merely the eggs. There's more water beside the duck pond than in it. The herbaceous border is utterly ruined. Hmm. It resembles nothing so much as uh, a bog. Well, bogs have their uses. You only have to ask the Irish. The bulbs have all been dug up. I fear there will be no daffodils at all next spring. Such a very common flower, I always think. The daffodil. So blousy and so very yellow. They're supposed to be yellow. That's what daffodils are. Yellow. Well, it doesn't suit them, does it, Amanda? It doesn't suit whom? I admit it's a shame about the crocus bulbs. Such a purposeful flower, the crocus. The way it points straight up to the sun. So erect and purple. So thrusting. Don't you think, Egbert? <coughs> I think they're both very attractive flowers. The daffodil and the crocus. And the iris, of course, in their own individual ways. <coughs> and what about the ducks? Delicious. Are you quite sure you wouldn't like some more? The hens may never settle back to lay. Well, it's a pretty dull life, isn't it? The life of a hen. All that scratching around in the dust, clucking in such an irritatingly tentative manner. I'm, I'm not sure that that is the point. <laughs> what is the point? Do tell me, Egbert. I'm all ears. I've nothing further to say on the matter. Oh, but you were just getting going. Let's say no more about it. <laughs> As luck would have it, Egbert was saved from further distressing provocation when, barely three days later, Laura was confined to bed. Her discomfort was somewhat alleviated by the satisfaction of causing Egbert the considerable cost and inconvenience of summoning the doctor. Oh. Lift your head a little. <coughs> that should make you feel more comfortable. <coughs> Anyhow, you needn't have made such a thin, peevish kind of fuss and gone on about it for the entire evening, and then have said, let's say no more about it, just when I was beginning to enjoy the discussion. There. Uh, that's better. <laughs> and that's when one of my petty, vindictive rages came in. Whatever do you mean? It was the day after the puppy episode. I turned the entire family of Speckled Sussex into Egbert's seedling shed. Oh, Laura, how could you? Oh, it came quite easy. Two of the hens pretended to be laying at the time and were most reluctant to move, but I was firm. And we thought it was an accident. Now, what if Egbert should discover it was you? Imagine the fuss. I don't mind to tell him for the sheer joy of seeing the look on his face. No, no please, please don't. <coughs> You're not really dying, are you? I have the doctor's permission to live till Tuesday. But today is Saturday. This is serious. I don't know about it being serious. It is certainly Saturday. Death is always serious. I never said I was going to die. Oh. I am presumably going to leave off being Laura, but I shall go on being something. An animal of some kind, I suppose. An animal? You see, when one hasn't been very good in the life one has just lived, one reincarnates in some lower organism. Does one? And I haven't been very good when one comes to think of it. I've been petty and mean and vindictive and all that sort of thing when circumstances have seemed to warrant it. No, circumstances never warrant that sort of thing. If you don't mind me saying so, Egbert is a circumstance that would warrant any amount of that sort of thing. You're married to him, that's different. You've sworn to love, honour and endure him. I haven't. 
I don't see what's wrong with Egbert. Oh, I dare say the wrongness has been on my part, particularly in relation to the events of the past few days. He has merely been the extenuating circumstance. But you know how devoted he is to his poultry and his garden. I know. You see, I really have some grounds for supposing that my next incarnation will be in a lower organism. <sighs> I shall definitely be an animal of some kind. On the other hand, I haven't been a bad sort in my way, so I think I may count on being a nice animal. Something elegant and lively, with a love of fun. <laughs> an otter, perhaps. <laughs> I can't imagine you as an otter. Well, I don't suppose you can imagine me as an angel if it comes to that. Uh, no, no, perhaps not an angel. Why an otter, of all creatures? Well, personally, I think an otter life would be rather enjoyable. What is it? Salmon to eat all year round. And the satisfaction of being able to fetch the trout in their own homes without having to wait for hours till they condescend to rise to the fly you've been dangling before them. <laughs> I had no idea you were so interested in fishing. And... An elegant, svelte figure. Mm, there is that. But think of the otter hounds. You know, how dreadful to be hunted and harried and finally worried to death. Oh, rather fun with half the neighbourhood looking on. And anyhow, not worse than this Saturday to Tuesday business of dying by inches. And then I should go on into something else. Whatever do you mean? go on into something else. Well, if I had been a moderately good otter, I suppose I should get back into human shape of some sort. Probably something rather primitive. Um, a little brown, unclothed Nubian boy, I should think. I wish you would be <laughs> serious. Oh. You, know, you really ought to be if you're only going to live till Tuesday. As a matter of fact, Laura died on Monday. Oh, so dreadfully upsetting, Sir Lulworth, Laura dying like that. I'd ask quite a lot of people down for golf and fishing, and the rhododendrons are just looking their best. I'd spend the best part of the morning at my escritoire writing to them all, telling them not to come. A little more notice would not have gone amiss. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura always was inconsiderate. She was born during Goodwood Week, with an ambassador staying in the house who hated babies. Uh. That's Laura through and through. The infant had only been alive and bawling for three days when the ambassador, uh, you probably knew him, Egbert, uh, used to shoot with the Ross Acliffs up at Glengarvey. Damn good shot, Sir Percy Ross Acliff. <laughs> His wife with a wandering eye. Uh, pretty little filly. Never could tell whether she was talking to you or to the fellow on your left. Uh, caught me out a fair few times, I can tell you. <laughs> good Lord. Well, it was more of an inconvenience than cause for alarm. What is it, Egbert? Something going on out there. Gracious. <laughs> In the form of garden. Quickly, man. Bring the garden. What became of the ambassador? Who? Oh, yes, 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 the ambassador. Three days of Laura, and he demanded that his bags be packed. He left the house with barely a word of thanks and hot-footed it back to darkest Africa to help subdue the natives of Bobo de Lasso. Oh, heavens! Yes, he quite missed Madame de Pompadour, charging into victory at twenty-five to one. <laughs> she had the maddest kind of ideas. Madame de Pompadour? No, not at all, my dear. Coming in first is rather what racehorses are encouraged to do. <laughs> Though, admittedly, the odds weren't in the old girl's favour. <laughs> I was talking about Laura, Sir Lulworth. Do you know if there's any insanity in her family? Insanity? Oh, I, I never heard of any. Her father lives in West Kensington, but I believe he's sane on all other subjects. No, she had an idea that she was going to be reincarnated as an otter. <laughs> ah, yeah. One meets with these ideas of reincarnation so frequently, even in the West, that one can hardly set them down as being mad. Really? Head porter of the Athenaeum, retired now, portly fellow, a remarkable moustache, utterly convinced that in a previous life 
He'd been a lady in waiting at the court of Marie Antoinette. No. He'd curtsy quite magnificently if prevailed upon so to do. Oh, fancy that. And then must know Viscount Arlington Lumley Duff. Mm, one of the Belgrave Square Arlington Lumley Duff. And their second oh. cousin, you know, with an arm and a slight squint. Particular fondness for parakeets. Uh, of course. Claims to be the reincarnation of a Roman senator who'd been in sole charge of aqueduct construction <laughs> and a female vaudeville performer <laughs> of questionable repute who resided above a public house on the old Kent Road. Fellow knows every music hall song you'd care to mention and, what's more, can sing them all in Latin. <laughs> Very versatile. But Laura, an otter. Laura was such an unaccountable person in this life that I should not like to lay down definite rules as to what she might be doing in an after state. You really think that she might have passed into some animal form? You simply would not believe it! Egbert! Absolutely dreadful must have happened. Four of my speckled Sussex have been killed. Oh, no! Oh, the very four that were to go to the show on Friday. Oh, what a oh. tragedy. One of them was dragged away and eaten right in the middle of that new carnation bed that I'd been to such trouble and expense over. Oh, poor Egbert. My best flower bed and my best fowls singled out for destruction. It almost seems as if the brute that did the deed had special knowledge of how to be as devastating as possible in the shortest space of time. Was it a fox, do you think? Sounds more like a polecat. Yes, it does sound more like a polecat. How very clever of you, Sir Lulworth. No. There were marks of webbed feet all over the place and we followed the tracks down to the stream at the bottom of the garden. Evidently, an otter. <coughs> ah, an otter. Would you sit down and have a little more kedgery, Egbert, dear? I find one can get quite used to it without the hard-boiled egg. I couldn't eat another thing. This dreadful business with the speckled Sussex has quite ruined my appetite. I'm going to see how Jeffreys is getting on with the strengthening of the poultry yard defences. I am so that otter! I think Laura might have at least waited until the funeral was over. Oh, it's her own funeral, you know. It's a nice point in etiquette how far one ought to show respect to one's own mortal remains. Is it? I think it highly likely that a character such as Laura would show a singular disregard for mortuary convention. <laughs> resurrection and the life, saith the Lord. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Aurora, darling, I didn't see you come in. Oh, what a very lovely hat. Such fascinating feathers. Ostrich. No. Shot it myself in the great Kowloon. Gracious! How exciting! No, not especially. An ostrich in the veldt is rather easier to spot than a partridge on the moor. Runs faster, though. Oh, does it? Longer legs. <laughs> <laughs> a bad business. I know. Mm. I wasn't sure Egbert would recover in time for the funeral. Was he so very fond of Laura? No. But he was very fond of his garden and his poultry. I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my death worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. <laughs> Had Egbert not felt the need to uphold proper standards of decorum, he might have foregone Laura's funeral rites and spent the morning strolling along the stream at the end of his garden, sighing with relief at the certain knowledge that Laura could be a source of no further irritation or expense. He might have heard a splash. 
He might have seen a svelte, dark brown creature swim swiftly to the opposite bank of the stream and clamber out and shake itself, and then head purposefully in the direction of the house. But, feeling the need to uphold proper standards of decorum, not only did Egbert grace Laura's funeral with his presence, he joined the party at the graveside. Man that is born of woman hath but a short time to live, and is full of misery. He cometh up and is cut down like a flower. He fleeth as it were a shadow, and never continueth in one stay. In the midst of life we are in death. I hear you've had to cancel Lady Dalrymple, Mrs. de Wop, and the Fitzstevenson twins. Jolly bad luck, that. I should say. Mm. The bunny Fitzstevenson had promised to teach me some of the new dance steps he'd picked up in Marseille. One hears that wasn't the only thing Bunny picked up in Marseille. He'd have picked up a little French, I dare say. Precisely. For as much as it hath pleased Almighty God of his great mercy, to take unto himself the soul of our dear sister, uh, Laura, here departed. We therefore commit her body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. Though Egbert was frequently heard to describe himself as a man of the world, and someone possessed of an education and upbringing that had equipped him for any eventuality, nothing could have prepared him for the scene that greeted him on his return from Laura's funeral and internment. Blast it, Otto! Got the remaining speckled Sussex! Every one of them dead! And look at the flower beds! It's as though the creature intentionally took a detour straight through them and back to the stream. And my strawberry beds in the lower garden, they're completely ruined. I shall get the otter hounds to come here at the earliest possible moment. On no account, you can't dream of such a thing. I mean, it wouldn't do so soon after a funeral in the house. It's a case of necessity. Once an otter takes to that sort of thing, it won't stop. Perhaps it will go elsewhere, now there are no more fowls left. I would think you wanted to shield the beast. There's been so little to in the stream lately. It hardly seems sporting to hunt an animal when it has so little chance of taking refuge anywhere. Oh, good gracious! I'm not thinking about sport. I want to have the animal killed as soon as possible. In the meantime, I'll make sure the beast doesn't come within a mile of my garden. Over here, Jeffries. Yes, sir. And here, if we hammer these stakes in at an angle like this and use a double width of wire, that should do the trick. That should do the trick. I hear the matter, sir. Look over there. Why, sir? Over there. What, over there, sir? I swear someone is watching us. Watching us, sir? From the stream? Well, they'd be pretty wet if they was, sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I suppose you're right. <laughs> Carry on, my good man. Yes, sir. And so Egbert and Jeffreys continued with their task of erecting otter defences, working tirelessly from early morning until dusk. At the end of the week they were able to survey the fruit of their labours with pride, secure in the certain knowledge 
that the creature would never again be able to cause either damage or upset. Bob Jeffries, how could you? Coming up behind me like that in my kitchen. Now, don't you go <laughs> pretending you don't like it when I nibbles you here like oh, this. Oh, no. <laughs> Tastes as good as anything you'll be dishing up today, that's for sure. <laughs> Any chance of a main course, do you suppose? Oh, I've enough trouble with Sir Lulworth and his wandering hands. You'd best be careful. They'll all be on from church any minute. Well, there's plenty of time. They won't even be on the last hymn. <laughs> now, come here, you beautiful big girl. Oh. Let's get this apron off for starters. Oh. 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 It's an otter. Well, I've never heard it called that before. Oh, no, not that. Put it away. There's an otter on the pantry table by the salmon. So what? Behind you. Well, there isn't a salmon on the table. Oh, that's because the otter's gone and took it. What otter? There's not an otter in the world could get through the fences I've just put up, let alone find its way into your pantry oh. for a spot of lunch. <laughs> You'll be telling me next it's gone up to the drawing room for a bit of a sit-down and a smoke. <laughs> You've an imagination on you, you have. Now, come here, okay. and let's get back to business. Oh. Mm. It's almost as though the animal knew how valuable it was. Look! At it. That Persian rug has been in the Queen family and in this drawing room for more than five generations, and now it's it's, it's covered in fish scales. Perhaps it wasn't the otter. Wasn't the otter? <laughs> oh, good lord, what an astonishing, powerful smell of fish. Ah, takes me back over 65 years. I've not smelt anything like it since my brief but not entirely uneventful career as a cabin boy on the Princess Louise. I shouldn't come in any further, Sir Lulworth. I'm sorry, my dear. I said I shouldn't come in any uh, further. Uh, uh, oh, oh, oh. Too late. Uh, what? Oh, I, I, I'm so sorry. I thought it was 12.30. It is 12.30. What has the time of day got to do with anything? I appear to have a piece of raw fish attached to the sole of my shoe. Perhaps Cook slipped while she was carrying the salmon and it fell onto your rug, Egbert. She's probably just hurried out to the scullery to fetch the carpet brush. Well, I should hire a new cook if I were you. You can't be having your luncheon tossed about the house. Sets a bad example to the rest of the staff. Oh, give me a leg up, would you, my dear? Oh, certainly, Sir Lulwa. Sets a bad example. Now, when I was staying at the Sterling Fuchses, uh, Christmas 1887, they had a Belgian cook, a, a, a Walloon, if I remember rightly. Of course it wasn't cook. There is a fish head on the seat of my favourite armchair. Oh, so there is. It was that otter. We shall have it hiding under our beds and biting pieces out of our feet before long. <gasps> well, Amanda, I can see that you know I am right. <laughs> They'll catch you and tear you into pieces. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Off you go, Otter. We find another home far away from Egbert's garden. The, the Otter hounds are on their way. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What an extraordinary commotion. Oh, oh, oh. So, Lulworth, I, I didn't see you coming. 
Oh. I thought someone was being attacked by a giant pike. Happened to a chum of mine once, you know. Oh, did it? The scars looked not unlike stigmata, oddly enough, although the fellow was a Scots Presbyterian through and through. I was just practicing my farmyard imitations for the oh. uh, village entertainment next week. Oh. Woof, woof. Ah, bah. <laughs> Very good, my dear. First class. Uh, do carry on. <laughs> nay, nay. Cock a doodle doo. Quack. <laughs> The day of the hunt dawned fine and clear, and half the village turned out for the spectacle. The hounds quickly picked up the otter's scent in the high wood and followed it down the stream. From time to time, and to Egbert's intense frustration, they danced around, barking and baying in confusion. Oh, good Lord, they've lost it again! What is the matter with those hounds? There it is, Aurora, by the fallen oak over there. Oh, well, I don't see it. No, over there. Oh. Look, it's staring straight at us. Oh. Quick, Aurora, it's heading for the pool. Uh-huh. Over here, man. <laughs> We've got to go this surround him now. How lovely to see you. Come, sit by the fire. Goodness, I'm exhausted. (laughs) You've got rather a lot of twigs in your hair. (laughs) Oh, good Lord, so I have. Oh, Oh, that. That's better. Oh, pity you weren't out with us. We had quite a good day. The otter gave us a jolly good one for our money, but we found it in the end, in the pool just below your garden. Did you kill it? Rather. Very fine she-otter. Your husband got rather badly bitten in trying to tail it. (laughs) Poor beast. I felt quite sorry for it. It had such a human look in its eyes when it was killed. You'll call me silly, but do you know who the look reminded me of? (sighs) Oh, my dear, what is the matter? And no, don't try to get up. (sighs) Though Egbert was not put in this world to be an assiduous visitor of the sick, he did, of course, do what was expected of him by his social class and circumstances. Every morning, just before eight, he paid a brief visit to the room in which his ailing wife was confined to bed. He inquired solicitously and succinctly after her health, threw the windows wide open, and patted her benevolently on the arm, before returning to the infinitely more important business of restoring his garden to at least an approximation of its former glory. No, not there, Jeffreys. Over here by this patch of Rudbeckia. We can't have yellow and blue side by side. No, sir. Everything in its proper place, that's what I always say. And I've rather gone off crocuses, uh, particularly the purple ones, so don't replant any of them. No, sir. And, Jeffreys, make sure the new ducks and speckled Sussex are locked away by six. Uh, I do it myself, but I've still not regained full use of this hand. Yes, sir. No sign of any more otters. But you can't be too careful. No, sir. Oh, and take the duck eggs to cook in the kitchen when you've finished, if you don't mind. Oh, no, sir. I don't mind at all. <laughs> Mm. 
Good to see you out and about again, Amanda, dear. Thank you, Sir Lulworth. I've been feeling a great deal better these past few weeks. I'm managing to leave my bed for one or two hours each day now. It was three on Sunday. Uh, you're still looking rather fragile, if I may be so bold. But I met a man in Bogner Regis once, curious fellow, sported in his tartan spats, as I recall, swore by his cure for nervous exhaustion. Did he? Mm, blessed if I can remember it. <laughs> his cure for baldness now, that I do remember. Uh, though I never was much taken by the notion of drinking one's own urine. <laughs> As you can see from this poor pate of mine, uh, speaking of the hirsute, Egbert, whatever became of that rather splendid otter you had stuffed and mounted at such expense? Do excuse me. I must go and lie down for a little while. I could have sworn it was in a glass case in the hall last time I was visiting. You've not transformed it into a pair of mittens, I hope. There's egg custard for dessert, Cook. We'll bring it through shortly. Amanda wouldn't stop blabbing till I promised to get rid of the thing. Oh, uh, I had to give it to a Laura Barrett. Here's the egg custard, sir. Oh, <gasps> Marvellous. Put it down here. There you go, sir. Uh, 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 Blasted otter business seems to have done for the girl's nerves. Mm. Oh, I say this is good. Huh. Dashed inconvenient, I call it. Ah, yes. The fairer sex, so fair and so delicate. Uh, perhaps a change of scene would help. Draw right of herself. Take it away for a while, or somewhere exotic. Ah, mm. ambrosia of the gods. As I understand, a voyage up the Nile did wonders for Lady Eleanor Montefiore Phipps after that unfortunate incident involving her third husband and an under-gardener from Crewe. And so, after no little consideration, Egbert gave detailed directives to Jeffreys regarding the replanting of the herbaceous borders, the management of the new flock of speckled Sussex, and the construction of the improved duck house, and, being a man of the world, instructed Thomas Cooks to make all the necessary arrangements for the recuperative journey to the Orient. darling to have brought me all the way to Egypt. It's so exotic. And to spend the first week on a boat on the Nile. How clever of you to think of it. I feel quite myself again. Well, that is a relief. <laughs> I rather thought I'd lost my old Amanda. <laughs> I feel rather foolish now, making such a fuss about an otter. Was I so very silly? Very. <laughs> Oh, Egbert. But I have to admit, it was an exceedingly audacious otter. <laughs> Wasn't it? And a remarkably discerning one of that. <laughs> an extraordinarily discriminating creature. With a particular taste for salmon served up on the best Persian rug. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what was that splash? Some species of otter, I'll wager. <laughs> Quite possibly. The lesser spotted Nile otter. <laughs> 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 Welcome to Cairo, sir. Madame, and welcome to Hotel Isis. My name is Mehmet. I am at your service. Is there else I can bring for you? Anything else at all? Some some fresh figs? Some, some pomegranates? No, thank you, Mehmet. Some dates? Some, uh, some pistache or nuts? <laughs> no, thank you. Just the champagne. Uh, what time will dinner be served? At eight o'clock, in the turquoise salon, madame. Thank you, boy. You can go now. Uh -huh. 
Your continuing very good health. Mm. Oh. You have to watch the natives, my dear. Give them an inch. And then what happens? They'll be selling your grandmother in the bazaar before you can as much as wink. No. It may make seem such a polite and very helpful old gentleman. How fortunate that we didn't bring Grandmama with us. I rather fancy a camel ride tomorrow. Yes, a camel ride followed by a trip out to the pyramids by pony and trap. Oh, that sounds lovely, Egbert. Be a darling and do up this necklace for me. The blue stones bring out the colour of your eyes quite nicely. Though I still think that Arab cheated us. Perhaps we should buy some more. I'm not sure I could stomach another day in the souk. All that shoving and shouting. So very uncivilised. So very un-English. And I could have sworn we were being watched. Watched? Whatever do you mean? A little less of that infernal Mohammedan weeping and wailing, thank you very much. You haven't seen my um, shirts anywhere, have you? Not since the maid unpacked them, put them away. Do you think she might have put them in the bathroom cupboard? I suppose she might have done. Oh, that's a stupid thing to do, she has. <laughs> Oi, you! Damnation! What is it? What is the matter? What's happened? The little beast has thrown all my clean shirts into the bath. Wait till I catch you! What little beast? A little beast! Of a naked brown Nubian boy! Oh. Amanda? Amanda? Somebody fetch a doctor! Amanda? was superlatively dramatized by Sue Eckstein from a very short story by Saki. Sir Lulworth was played with lovable eccentricity by Benjamin Whitrow. Egbert with understandable irascibility by John Warnerby. Amanda with an attractive innocence by Candida Benson. Laura with a sophisticated wickedness by Irene McDougall. Joanna Tope showed her paces as both Aurora and the cook, while Jeffreys and the vicar were played with his usual smooth versatility by Michael Mackenzie, who also, of course, narrated. The other part was played by a member of the company. The play was directed in a delightful little East Lothian country house, well, an old school, actually, by the enigmatic Bruce Young. <laughs>